So, public speaking is typically very high up on the list of people's fears. Second only to some people, to a large majority of people actually, second only to the fear of death. So, how many of you are afraid of public speaking? Okay, hey, I appreciate that you're honest about it. Everybody gets anxious getting up in front of a group. The more you do it, it's like anything else, riding a bike. The more you do it, the more relaxed you are, the more self-aware you are, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. I'm gonna give you some tips for speaking in public and doing it in a way that um, you can really start to see how you begin and how you can overcome and become better. So let's start, I've outli I think we're on green, what do you say, 49 maybe? Somebody give me a yes or no. Yes, green 49, bingo. All right, so I've listed three areas that we're gonna talk about and a couple of lines there that you have so that you can fill things in. Now, how many of you were in one of the leading lab class panels this morning? in that with me. Okay, very good. For anybody who wasn't, I'm Dr. Alexa Chilcutt. I'm the director of the public speaking program in the College of Communication and Information Sciences. And I manage about 10 TAs, GTAs, teaching my performance classes. And I teach approximately 1,200 students a year. And I do the large lectures. The other thing is I do public speaking as a kind of side profession. I give CE courses and speak to dental groups primarily in Georgia and Alabama for CE courses. And so I understand what it means to be, have a very practical approach to public speaking, not just from a rhetorical perspective. And I try and teach from that practical approach. So that's what we're gonna do today. I gave you some rhetorical terms, but I'm gonna make them make sense for you. So let's begin with the second one. The second one I should have probably put first, and we talked about it in leading lab classes, and that was credibility or professionalism. And to give you the rhetorical term, that's ethos. So ethos is credibility, and it's credibility of the speaker as perceived by the audience during the time that the speaker is up in front of that audience. They don't know how brilliant you are outside of that time that you are in front of them. So you have to make that impression on them. Now, how do you become a credible speaker? So let's look at three things, three major things. So on the first line, you can put appearance. Appearance is the first, kind of making that first impression, that initial first impression with public speaking. In the leading lab classes, we discussed that. How do you look or appear professional. And if you were in there, you heard me cite that 80% of a first impression is based on sight alone. And I love college students who like to argue with me about this and say, well, that's not fair. It shouldn't matter that I have 50 tattoos and my hair is five colors. You should still think I'm brilliant. Well, that's lovely. And there are plenty of places that will let you work in the basement. I've said that to them in class. So you have to make that first impression, and the first impression with ethos is truly how you look, your appearance. So make sure that you're neat and clean and put together so that automatically before you even open your mouth, that first impression that you've made on them is that you are together and that you are in control. The second thing is gestures. It's body language. Now, I could be doing two things. One thing I could be doing is this, and talking to you for 30 minutes from right here. Do you appreciate that? No, no you don't. This is a barrier. This is a physical barrier between you and your class. So don't get stuck behind the podium. The other thing I could have done is I could have had a PowerPoint. I'm sure that I could make that effective using it visually. But the other thing about public speaking is, and, and what they're seeing about you is, either you block yourself off here, or you're doing this. And according to, they're not engaged, and you're not engaged with them. 
So credibility is in your body language as well. So what you look like, how you carry yourself. Walk into that room, be there, be in the middle of it. Have a nice strong posture, which means that your feet need to be below your shoulders. Females, for some reason, tend to do this a little more than guys. It's just insecurity. It's just insecurity. But what does it look like? I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> OK? And this is just, you automatically do it, and you don't even think about it. So pay attention to your body language. Don't do this. Don't rock. Don't, you know, do crazy stuff with your hands. Ladies, since I'm teaching public speaking and I've got all these lovely undergraduate girls, so many of them have long hair right now. And guys, you don't have to worry about this as much, although I have seen a great case of a guy and his hair was a complete distraction. But they, they treat their hair like it's their favorite pet. Okay? And I even had a guy who had bangs, and it was that whole. <laughs> All right. This is communicating. You cannot not communicate. That's the reality. Even if you're not saying something, you're communicating. So make sure that your hand, you're trying to be as distraction-free as possible. Your hands can be out here. I talk with my hands. That's OK. But pay attention to your body language and look like you're not insecure. Because I know that you all are insecure, and that's OK. It's OK. So the second thing was body language. And have, have facial expressions. Look at your students, smile, eye contact, nod your head, act like you're interested in it, and they'll be interested as well. So nonverbal. The third thing under there, under your nonverbal communication in those three lines, is your voice. Your voice, your vocal qualities are nonverbal. Now, how is that? How are you communicating something about yourself and your credibility with your voice? Somebody tell me. Confidence, OK. What were you going to say? All right, your tone of voice. Whether you're all right. Oh, man, right? You all. At some point growing up, I know this is dating me, not you, but you remember Ferris Bueller? OK? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Don't be, don't have that monotone voice. Have some enthusiasm talking to your students. Greet them enthusiastically. The other thing with your voice is volume, confidence, project. They have to hear you. You may be insecure, but you don't need for them to feel like you're insecure. So project. The other thing is, and I know it's so much easier to, to, for me to sound like I'm picking on females, but this is true. Females have a much more difficult time in dealing with the nonverbals of their vocal qualities. Why is that? Because females have a much higher pitch, naturally. And the higher the pitch, the more it registers in a, in a male's brain in the emotional portion of their brain. Which is why men think that women, especially those women with higher pitched voices, are so emotional. So if you have that really sweet high pitched voice, it doesn't sound very credible. So bring it down. Bring it down. Get real. OK. Any comments on vocal, vocal variety? Now, how many of you have a voice message on your cell phone? Raise your hands. Yes, you do. Do you enjoy creating that message and then hitting playback, listening to yourself? No, you don't. In public speaking, we record everyone's speeches, and we make the students watch themselves and listen to themselves. So one of the, t the tips that I have for you, and this is, tr this is crucial, if you have any way to record a lesson that you give. Now, in, in our college, we have most of our rooms are equipped with recording devices.
to record the lecture. See if you can't record in your lab. Even if you set up you know, your cell phone somehow to record you or a camera, but watch yourself, watch your body language. You're gonna be doing things that you didn't know you did. And you're gonna sound differently than you thought you sounded. So self-awareness is key in teaching. I recorded myself teaching. I teach the large lecture of public speaking. It's 220. And because I don't want 220 to go to sleep, I'm walking up and down the steps like this. Walk up and down the steps. Well, what do you think about that? I never stand in the front of the room. And I thought that was incredibly effective. And so I walk up and down the steps and I walk side to side because I want them to feel like I see you. I see you, you're not invisible. Because in larger groups like this, people tend to think that they're invisible. You're not, I see you. But I recorded myself and I went back and I watched and I look like a daggum yo-yo. I didn't know that, it's self-awareness. So now I have to make it much more purposeful. I have to stop trying to just aimlessly wander around and make fewer trips to the up the aisle and around the sides so that I don't, it, it was almost to a distracting point. So self-awareness in public speaking is key. So that's my first, nonverbal communication. Now. If you look under ethos number two and you look at the second little category that I have with three lines, it's about verbal communication, the words. Typically in a face-to-face -face interaction, the words only make up about 7% of the message's meaning to the person who's listening to you. They're getting so much more from your body language, from your tone of voice, than they are from the actual words that you're saying. This means that it's crucial what you're saying. So you do have to prepare. You have to prepare what you're saying and you have to think about, rehearse it. The first couple of times that I taught classes or that I did a CE course for a group or did some type of speech, I always rehearsed. I put on the clothes that I was gonna put on. I set the timer, I pretended like I was in that space. And sometimes I got in that space ahead of time and ran through it so that I didn't mess up more than I had to. So know what you're gonna say and make it meaningful. In verbal communication, the biggest thing is you're all in grad school. You're teaching undergraduates. It's wonderful that you're in the master's or the PhD program and that you're learning $50,000 words. And you need to speak like that in those grad classes, but remember, all of that over their head jargon is not an effective way to communicate to your students. So verbal communication creates shared meaning. If you write nothing else down, write that under verbal communication. The goal is to create shared meaning. So think about the word choice when you're speaking to them. I know what I mean but how, I'm, how am I going to communicate that in a way that they get it? It's not over their head. The other thing with verbal communication is eliminating verbal fillers. Eliminating verbal fillers. It's one of the things that when you record yourself, you don't know that you've said um 50 times in a span of a minute and a half because the brain works, the thought speed is about four times the speed of speaking. So your brain is running four times faster than your mouth can possibly speak. We're taking in and thinking about information all of the time. So if you haven't practiced and prepared what you're going to say, you don't feel confident about it, what's gonna happen is every time that your brain is searching for the next word, it interjects an uh, um, and, like, or you know. Anybody feel like they have a problem with that? Yes, I see some nods, I see some hands. Here's my thing, and I, I say this to students, because now all you hear is, and like, and like, and then yesterday I like went to like Target, and like, it was so crowded, and like, I just don't know. And, and like, I stopped students going down the hall. Stop. 
They think I'm crazy. That's okay. Stop them. I don't know them. I've heard them from the water fountain coming down the hall. I've listened to you for 30 seconds. You've said nothing. <laughs> nothing. And then I get the crazy looks like, who does she think she is? The public speaking teacher. <laughs> That's who I am. So if you know that you have a problem with like or and like, you know, find a friend. Find a friend. Maybe you live with a friend. Maybe you're going to work with a friend, be in class with a friend every day. To kind of do that, what's his name, the dog whisperer? Caesar. Do the Caesar thing, right? Say, give them permission every time I say like. I want you to tss. Tss. I have a TA who has started like everything. So I stand in my office and I go, and it frustrates the stew out of me. And I said, you can't be a public speaking instructor and say like every other word. So eliminate verbal fillers, but you have to record yourself to recognize if you're saying um. Um is a key one that you do not know that you're doing. And I've heard from other students, there's supposedly a history professor that it, it's so distracting, that's what the students do, they count the ums. They're not listening to the content. So to be effective, you have to eliminate verbal distractions. Create shared meaning, no jargon. And as I said, think about what you're going to say. Prepare ahead of time so that you're not tripping over your words. Make those words meaningful. All right, let's go up to number one now. We're going to create logos, which means logic. Everybody's heard, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them, right? It's true. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Hey, today, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have an introduction to every class or lab. This is what we're going to talk about today. Remember in lecture yesterday, the professor discussed this. We're going to go over, we're going to have a, an activity that focuses on ABC. If you're teaching a standalone class by yourself, which many of you may be doing, and you don't have, it's not a lab to a lecture, then in every class begin with, remember last class we talked about X. Today we're going to discuss A, B, and C. Because they want to know what they're going to do. In eliminating that ambiguity, nobody likes to listen to someone if they don't know where that person's going. Because they think, how long is this, tip how long is this going to last? You know that I have three points and I'm on number two. You're happy. You're happy with that. You're going to be happier when I'm on number three. So let them know what the logical order is going to be. The other thing is, in logic, cite, cite material. Where did you get that from? You have to tell them that you're a credible speaker and that you're logical and that that information is logical. Is it factual? Where did you get it? According to the book on such and such, verbally cite where you're getting that information. Professor so-and-so stated in the lecture, so that they see you as, okay, this is, it's making a logical argument that I can follow. But truly, tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them, and at the end, today, review. So preview, do your, what you got to do in the, in the course of the lab, and then do a review at the end. Today we did this. It's a wrap up. And tomorrow we're going to do that. They like to know. They like for any audience likes to know that there's some logical progression to the information that you're giving them. Does that make sense? Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them. And tell them what you told them. There you go. And three is always a magic number. Three for anything. Okay, let's move on to number three, our final point. See, now you're getting happy. She doesn't have much time left. Pathos. Now, how in the world does this have anything to do with public speaking in a lab? 
What it means is an emotional appeal for your audience. In class or in any audience, what the audience's number one question is, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? Why should I care? So answer that question for them. Even if it's something lofty, some physics concept, make it relatable to your students. Come up with an interesting example, an analogy, a story, something like we talked about this morning, something that's happened in current events. Make it relatable so that you can connect with them and they go, oh, okay, this makes sense and this does matter to me somehow. So in emotional appeals, you have to think about, people love hearing stories. So talk about stories, talk about examples. Make them visualize and feel some connection with the information. All right, so pathos. Now, what are my final tips? My final tips truly are become more self-aware. There are no perfect public speakers. I am not a perfect public speaker. But you can always become better. It's the people that are atrocious and don't know they're atrocious that never get any better and they don't care. Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. It didn't matter. But record yourself, rehearse, and regulate. So record yourself so that you know what you're doing. Even if, you do, even if before that first lab, you do nothing but use your phone and audio record the introduction that you're going to make to the lab. If you can get through the first 30 seconds to a minute, you've gotten over a huge hurdle. And for those of you who raised your hands and said that you, were very, you had public speaking anxiety, this is key. If you can get through the first 30 seconds or a minute, rehearse that introduction that you're going to have on that first day and figure out some way for you to get comfortable with the group. The other thing that I was telling in the, the last, the second, I didn't say it in the first leading lab session, but one of my TAs did this and now all of them are doing it, but as they go through the role, they're asking a question of the day. And it gets the students in the class used to speaking and it creates a more comfortable environment. And the more comfortable they are, the more comfortable you're gonna be with them. So ask a question of the day. You know, today, tell me the most interesting or horrible job you've ever had. And then go down the roll, call their name, and let them answer. Make it a comfortable environment so that you don't feel like you're always having to perform and put on your suit of armor to walk in there. Okay, any questions? I know this is, it's, it's down and dirty in 25 minutes. Yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, you know what? I had a TA who had a physical impairment and she, in fact, she had a glass eye. She had had cancer as a child and she came up to me and she said, I, I don't, she was used to wearing her hair where it kind of came over that eye because she was self-conscious. And I told her, listen, first day of lab, that's what you say. Hey guys, this is who I am and this is what I'm dealing with. Because if you answer the question, you've eliminated the mystery. And they'll deal with it. They'll be fine. Okay, you were asking a question? Go ahead. Public speaking 101. Yes. Thanks for the practice. Uh -huh. Okay, so you said to record yourself and rehearse it and then you said something after that and I... Regulate. Don't. Regulate. Can you talk more about what regulate means? It, it really just means recognizing what you're doing that you would like to change and make better. I mean, you've all heard of emotional intelligence. Yes? I see some nods. Emotional intelligence is, hey, it's wonderful that you have an IQ of 145. I'm glad for you. But if you don't have enough emotional intelligence to be self-aware, okay, how many of you know somebody who's extremely brilliant but couldn't get out of a wet paper bag if they had to? That's what I'm talking about. That's a lack of self-awareness. Or they're extremely brilliant, but they can't hold a conversation with somebody. They don't have 
awareness and the ability to self-regulate. So that recording yourself is awareness. It's painful, but that's just part of the process. And so what am I going to do to start trying to make those things that I didn't like watching or hearing better? Okay? Yes, ma'am. Um, going from your teaching here, I'm going to tell you where you can find the resource to record yourself, your physical, whole body, and everything. Here, grab the microphone so they can hear you. I'm, I'm implementing what I just learned. Go ahead. Okay, I'm going to tell you where you can go find a free place to videotape yourself, not so that you have the visual as well as the audio. If you will look on page 11, the Sanford Resource Center here on campus will provide you with an entire audio booth, and they will record you, they will videotape you, and then you can, I lost my page, you can record, uh -huh. do something okay. else with it, and then you can regulate it. <laughs> there you go. Okay, record, yeah, rehearse, all right? Very good, very good. Yeah, and like I said, even a phone or a camera, and a lot of the rooms are set up that way so that you can watch yourself. Are you gonna wanna upload it to YouTube? Probably not. But that's okay. All right, somebody else? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? We good? All right. I hope. Wish you all the success.